processing right now the low res. I'm leaving town again today at um, 8 o'clock, but I put it in a format I can upload from the road. It's a low res format. When I get back on Sunday, <coughs> probably it'll be Monday, I'll do it the high res version for lecture five and I'll put up today's. So I'll get those both processed on my computer. It's a 19 gig file, so I can't upload it from the road. It, just, it would take five it's longer than I could do that. Just, you know, Comcast or anything like that, uploading 19 gigs is impossible. Here it takes me about 80 minutes. And so it's lightning fast at school, it's, it's terrible everywhere else. But I can put up low res version, so the low res is only about a gig, 1.2 gig. I can do that from the road. That's like the elevator movie. About half as fast uploading, but I can do that. So I'll get those uploaded in low res format in San Diego, and then uh, do what I can get the high-res versions up. And I'm sorry this has been such a hassle. Okay, well, let's get to the material. So this stuff isn't easy we're doing right now. It's foundational. It's important. We can answer some interesting questions once we get it all built. But um, for now, it's, it's, it's not all that fun, I realize. Um, one of the key questions in the recent recession is the effectiveness of monetary and fiscal policy in deep recessions. And there's been a lot of fights about that out there among economists, particularly over the effectiveness of fiscal policy, but also monetary policy. So there's some of us who don't think monetary policy is very potent in recessions. I think that fiscal policy is near full employment. I think it flip blocks. Monetary policy is really effective. Fiscal policy really isn't. And we want to be able to ask our ISLM model that we're building questions like that. When is monetary policy effective? When is fiscal policy effective? In the short run, in that time period when, when prices are fixed. And so in order to do that, we're going to have to talk about the slopes of the IS and the LM curves. So today I'm going to have to try to convince you, and this is, this is relatively hard, um, when the IS curve would be flatter and when it would be steeper and why. And I'm going to try to do it all graphically and intuitively. Mathematically, it's actually really, truly easy to do, but the math is probably harder for you for some of you. So all you do is use other techniques. But the question is, when is the IS and LM curve, and for today, just the IS curve, flat or steep? See, let's think about monetary policy. I can have a really steep IS curve, so this is in relationship with the work up in I and Y. We haven't done this yet. Or I can have a really flat IS curve. I can have one of the two. Here's my LM curve. Now, we haven't done this yet, but this depends upon monetary policy. And this is the level of output that would be equal to. This isn't anything you know yet. I'm just trying to set up why I'm doing what I'm doing. When we shift the LM curve out through monetary policy, Output would only go up a little tiny bit if the IS curve was steep, but it might go up a whole lot if the IS curve were flat. So exactly how much, how effective monetary policy is going to be critically on the slope of that IS curve. So we need to know, when is it steep, when is it flat? It's hard, to, I'm not going to show you now, but I can, I can do the same thing for fiscal policy. Sometimes it'll be effective, sometimes it'll be ineffective, depending on the slopes of those, of those curves, both the IS and the LM. So, so right now, I just want to ask, when is it flat and when is it steep? Because we really want to tackle this question about the size of monetary and fiscal policy multipliers in deep recessions and in full employment. I just want to cover the recent past, I want to cover the whole thing. And we're going to find that this model predicts exactly what I just said, that fiscal policy is relatively effective in a recession, relatively ineffective in full employment. Monetary policy is just the opposite. Monetary policy has a pretty good effect through full employment and a bad effect. Uh, it doesn't work very well at all in, in recessions. It's not to say it doesn't work at all, it can't do things. 
but uh, it's not as effective as it would be in your full employment. So, yeah. so far, what we've done is we said, okay, the equation of the IS curve is this. I think we were using I. Yes. So what we added last time was this. And that gives us, for, for given T and G, it gives us a relationship between I and Y. And that relationship we've been calling the IS curve. And then I did a, an example of a linear system with the end last time and see that you can see, okay, yeah, I see. We actually wrote the IS curve in slope intercept form to try to convince you that yes, in fact, it is some relationship between I and Y, has a negative slope, all that sorts of things. So the first thing we did was we just derived this IS curve. We did it from a 45 degree line diagram. So we took this diagram, we actually derived the IS curve from this thing. But we, we, we We've done this already. Then we talked about why the IS curve shifts. And we said anything except the interest rate, because the interest rate moves you along the IS curve, anything that causes spending to go up causes the IS curve to shift out. Government spending up, taxes down, autonomous consumption up, autonomous investment up, any of those things going up is going to shift that thing out. They go down, it shifts the other way. So we, we, we talked about the equation of the IS curve. We derived the IS curve graphically. I actually told you the slope of this thing mathematically. And then we talked about shifts in the IS curve. And we said it shifts whenever demand goes up as long as it's not driven by interest rate change. Is that moves you along the interest rates on the axis. And again, it's just all the equilibrium pairs, I and Y, in the goods line. So now the next thing we want to know about is the slope of the IS curve. When is it flat? When is it steep? Now I worked out the slope of the IS curve mathematically. Let's just take a look at this. At this. Whether you know how to do it or not, we said it's equal to 1 minus C of Y minus T plus I of Y over I of I. Intuitively, for those of you who are sort of haven't had this stuff, x to the a means the responsiveness of x to a. It's how much x changes when we change a. It's how much x responds when we change in a. It's a partial derivative. It's a change in x over the change in a. Just a, this is a notation for partial x, partial a. And you can also use x a. They're all, all the same thing. One's in one's in you don't care. Um, so what we can see, this is negative. But in absolute value, as this thing gets big, because a great big negative number, what happens in the slope? It gets flatter. Because this is a bigger number. So the slope is a smaller number. It gets flatter. So the first thing we know is that as the responsiveness of investment to the interest rate goes up, the IS curve gets flatter. When do you think that the investment's most responsive to the interest rate? Your full employment or in a recession? Interest rate drops by 1%. Would you invest more if the economy was booming or if you're in a recession with all sorts of factories and equipment sitting around? Near full employment, it's probably more responsive than it is in a recession, right? The Fed drops the interest rate from 3% to 2%. It's a deep recession. You got a bunch of trucks and equipment you're not using. Why would you buy more trucks or build a new factory if you've got one sitting doing nothing? You probably wouldn't. So interest rate changes in a recession are probably 
less effective in terms of stimulating investment than they are in their full employment. So that tells us this is probably bigger in near full employment and smaller in recession. So we probably get a steep IS near full employment. That's the case I just said for monetary. Our steep, steep IS in a recession, because this is small, and a flat IS near full employment, flatter, because this is big. And that's going to have implications for policy. So those are the kinds of questions I want to, I want to look at. Now I want to show you this graphically in a second exactly why this is, and, and intuitively. But we can see from the formula that as investment becomes more responsive to the interest rate, the IS curve gets flatter. So you might think that, okay, there's the IS curve in a recession, there's the IS curve in full employment. Did I, no, I did that wrong. Right. Yeah. This is the recession because it's small, and this is your full employment. slope of the IS curve works is you lower the interest rate and that causes investment to go up and that causes output to go up. This is the responsiveness of investment to the interest rate. So what, when this is bigger, what we need is for a given fall in the interest rate, this goes up more. So you can see this very easily. Just start with an I0 and a Y0 and let the interest rate fall to I1. If investment goes up, if this is small, it only goes up a little bit. So that would be the Y with a small response of investment. Right? If that's small, that's small. But what if we thought this was great big? Same fall in the interest rate, but hold that constant. But if this is bigger, the investment change is bigger, so the income change is bigger. So you're going to get an even bigger ch change. So you're either going to get here with a small one, or there's a Y with smaller and larger responsiveness of investment to the interest rate. So I'm either going to get this IS curve when it's small, it's steep, or I'm going to get this IS curve when it's bigger. So intuitively, it's easy. Mathematically, it's pretty easy. Graphically, which is usually your favorite, this is actually kind of hard. So when I of I goes up, for a given fall in the interest rate, we get more investment, so we get more output. And that makes the IS curve flat. This thing is fixed. That's I0 to I1. And then how much that goes up and how much that goes up depends upon the size of the response. And again, if I had monetary policy, the steep one in the recession, monetary policy is not very effective. Well, employment is going to have more of that. We're not there yet. That's what we're getting at. Where does the slope of IS fit into the IS curve? What, what's that? It's totally different. Say the slope of the IS curve, this formula right here, where does that fit in to the IS curve? Okay. Um, So you start with the equation describing the IS curve. And you say for G and T constant, what is DI DY? Because I want it's in this IY space, so I want to slope in DI DY. So what you do is you take this equation and you do something called a total derivative. 
dy was a partial of c with respect to the y minus t d argument dy minus dt plus i of i di plus i of y dy plus dg. So you take a derivative of the equilibrium. I want to know what the change is due to ch change in y in the equilibrium. So I make this zero because I want to hold that constant. So there's no change in g. These just change it. This is not a, That's zero because I'm holding that constant. If I solve this, I'll get the di dy is 1 minus c of y minus t plus i of y. So you just bring the, this, bring this to the other side to get one minus c one, and bring this to the other side to get minus i of y. Then you get that i of i, d of i here. So the d i d y. There's the d i d, and there's that. It's just the derivative of that. But you have to do the implicit derivative because you have the y on the right side. Try to drive this graphic right now. So what we're going to do is just derive the IS curve twice on the same diagram with different assumptions about the size of that I of I parameter. So this is just a 45 degree line diagram. C plus I and I plus G. All I care about is I guess I'll write it off. So I don't want to confuse I don't want to. <coughs> Shoot, there's at least one person. But it's not you, right? So this is, we're going to start off at I0 and Y0. So we're here at I0 and Y0. Now I'm going to do just what I did intuitively. I'm going to let i fall to i1 from i0. And I'm going to see what the is curve looks like under two different situations. Remember how this works? When I lower the interest rate, what happens to this line? That shifts up, right? So when, when i goes down, this shifts up. We hate this problem, so we'll, we'll use the or so this shifts up to say there, c of y minus t plus i of y and i1 plus g. So there is one possible is curve right there between those lines. So one is curve is that. But if i of i is bigger, for the same fall in the interest rate, I'll get what? A bigger change in investment. So if I of I were bigger, if we got more responsive investment, this would shift up even more. Right? So the size of the, if there were, say I of I was zero, there's no response. It would just stay fixed. It wouldn't move at all. Because investment didn't go up. So the more investment goes up, the more that shifts. So the bigger I of I is, the bigger the response, the more it shifts. Remember, I goes down, and then I goes up, and then Y goes up. This, is, this part here is the upward shift. So if we had, I don't like those colors. I'm going to have to open this brand new one. So the interest rate fell, so they shifted up. Because investment goes up. Because investment's a function of the interest rate. So interest rate from I0 to I1, so investment went up. How much it goes up simply depends upon how much investment responds. So it's possible if I allow, oh, that's a really nice chart. 
trust you get your hands dirty. Um, or even bigger, that's a terrible problem. <laughs> Mathematically, it's just the denominator getting bigger than magnitude. So it's still it's smaller. Intuitively, it was easy. And I goes down, I goes up, and the more I goes up, the more Y goes up. So this is I of I here. You get a factor, and graphically, it looks like Okay. There's only one more, even though there's three parameters, we can do the next two as they're the same thing, fortunately. So we can do it all as one single case. So now we need to remember the slope, di, dy, is 1 minus c of y minus t plus i of y over i of i. So now I want to look at these two parameters, c of y minus t and i of y. Now remember that this is less than 1, 
is the, the biggest we're letting this get is one. Otherwise, we get weird things happening in our model. So we're assuming that's between zero and one. When is it flattest? When these things get, if these were equal to one, what would the slope be? Zero. They're completely flat. If these were zero, which is as small as it can get, what would it be? It'd be steeper. It's not completely, oh yeah, it'd be not quite. You want to ride, right? It's not perfectly vertical, but it's as steep as it can get. This one you can get vertical and then you get zero. You can't quite get vertical there. So in a recession, if literally there was no response, you actually have a vertical. Okay. So what that tells us is what? That says as c of y minus t plus i of y goes to 1, gets closer to 1, the is curve gets flat. The bigger they are, the flatter it is. Right? Now we can ask why. What's the intuition in that? What, what's going on in the model to make that true? If these go to 1, slope 0, so it's perfectly flat. So as this gets closer and closer to 1, these get flat. It gets flat and flat and flat. The slope is when i goes down, investment goes up, and output goes up. This goes up by the multiplier. The multiplier was 1 over 1 minus c of y minus t plus i of y for this model. We've worked that out many times. Except you use numbers there. This was that 1 fourth plus 1 eighth, that 3 fourths plus 1 eighth I did last time. Mm -hmm. Are we going to be using majority of numbers or variables? Problem. Problems. Okay. So, as c of y minus t of i as y goes to 1, what's the multiplier do? It's really big. Yeah, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So what's happening is that when, when, when c of y minus t plus i of y, either one, goes up, the multiplier is bigger. The multiplier, you can't see that, is 1 over 1 minus c of y minus t plus i of y. So for a given fall in the interest rate from i0, y0 to i1, there's y with a smaller multiplier, right? y doesn't go up very much at all. The multiplier 0 doesn't go up at all for a given following. So the, the closer, the more responsive investment and consumption are to income, the bigger the response. So one IS curve is that. But if those things are close to 1, the multiplier is huge. Then you get a much bigger change. And the IS curve would be a lot flatter. So that's the IS curve for a bigger multiplier. It's the same as saying C of Y minus T up or I of Y. That sum goes up. The multiplier gets bigger. So the bigger the multiplier is. So investment's going down, up, interest rate's going down, investment goes up by I of I. So investment goes up. Then output goes up because investment went up. And it goes up by the amount of the multiplier. So investment goes up by the line, it goes up by the amount of the multiplier. So the bigger the multiplier is, the bigger the output response for a given fall in interest rate and the flag of the IS curve. So if the MPC is larger, or the response of investment to income is larger, you're going to get a bigger uh, 
I'm flattered. These two parameters don't vary all that much over the business cycle. This one does. So this is the one I'm mostly interested in was the first case. But just for completeness, we should do this one too. But, but mostly the variation on the business cycle is this one. This has changed a little bit, but it changed basically straight. This, we're going to go back to easier stuff. So this is a graphical on this. Remember the expenditure function <coughs> was E equals C of Y minus T plus I of I and Y plus G. It's that thing on the 45 degree line. Oops, we're using Z, I'm so sorry. That's Z equals C plus I. Remember that thing? That's our, then we put the 45 degree line on here. You get the equilibrium. We've been doing that since 202. The slope of this thing is just how much z responds to, here's y, and here's z. So if I increase y by 1, the slope is how much that goes up. It goes up by the amount consumption goes up, which is c of y minus t, and the amount that investment goes up, which is i of y. So if those things, if you get more consumption for, so we change income this, this amount, if consumption responds more, consumption is more responsive, what's that do to the slope of this thing? Steeper. We start at this point, now we go through there. If I of Y is bigger, if for a given change in income, we get a bigger increase in investment, we get a bigger increase in Z, this thing will be steeper. And so if C of Y minus T or I of Y goes up, the Z curve is steeper. The expenditure function is steeper. Because for a given increase in income, we get a bigger change in expenditures. Because they're more responsive. the mathematically inclined, it's just dz dy. dz dy is c of y minus t plus i of y. So this is a bigger c of y minus t or i of y. So it's steeper. I0 in both cases. So we're starting at I0 and Y0. So 
what we do is just what we do always. We lower the interest rate to I1, and these curves shift up. They shift up by I of I. And we're assuming that's the same for both curves. The only difference is one of these two parameters. One of those is bigger. I of I is the same, so they shift identically. So with a flat IS curve, or flat Z, you get that Z prime. That's for I1. With the steeper one, supposed to be parallel on this. So we shift this up by exactly the same amount. We just take these two lines and lift them and we set them back down here. We follow the flat line you'll get y1, that's c of y minus t, or i of y smaller. Or we get out here to this equilibrium, so it crosses the 45 degree line. There's the y1 with c of y minus t, or i of y. So if we just drop these down, there's one IS curve in this. Then another one, so here's, here's one more one, here's the other one one. Or we get out to this point right here, we get this. So as this curve gets steeper, you move the, the point moves that way. So you start with a shift the white line up, and then just start pivoting around this point, make it steeper and steeper. This point moves in that direction. It's it flatter and flatter. And so the steeper this curve is, the bigger these things are. The flatter the IS Which one do you want me to do again? Go back over, you got it. This stuff here is probably budget practice. Let me, let, me, let me just try to show you something. These parameters make any sense. Let me do a linear case real quick. We might have C equals 
200 plus 1 half y minus t. That's going to be c of y minus t. That's the response to consumption to disposable income. So c of y minus t is the response of consumption to a change in y minus t. That's what got. So that's what this one half here is. It's just how much consumption response is. Then we might have i equals 700 plus one fourth y minus six i. This is what this is the c of what this is what we need to i of y. Y goes up by one, I goes up by one quarter. So this is the I of Y parameter. Then the expenditure function is C plus I plus G, but they're calling Z. So it's 200 plus one half Y minus T plus 700 plus one fourth Y minus 6i. Oh, and this is i of i right here. The 6 is how much investment goes up if the interest rate goes up. show you is we were saying that the size of the sh upward shift depends upon I of I. When I goes down, it's negative. The amount of shifts up is going to depend upon this number, because that's in the intercept. So if this goes, if this were 10, instead of, if I lower this by 1, this will shift up by 6. If I of I were bigger in absolute value, if this were minus 10, it's going to shift up even further. So that's the first exercise. The size of that horizontal shift depends upon the magnitude of this thing. The slope depends upon c of y minus t and i of y. 
When these get bigger, closer to 1, instead of being 3 fourths, they're 0 0.8, 0 0.9, this is going to get steeper and steeper. That's the 
derivation. That's the it's intuitively it's pretty simple. When y goes up, money demand goes up. And that drives up the price of money. see it in the equation. This number is fixed. This is fixed. These have to be equal. If y goes up, this side's bigger. So how do we make it smaller? By letting i go up. So when y goes up, i has to go up to make this go down so this product is still equal to this. So it's that simple. This makes money demand go back down. So have to look at is if m over p goes up, the curve shifts up. So that's what I want to show you next. That's the result graph. Hold the unit. Let's see if we can do it without math. mathematically, if you wanted to, you would find dy dm or dy dp given d all else equals zero. So you totally differentiate this, and 
and you find dm, dy, everything else held constant. I won't do it. That's how you Let's do it graphically. Take that side by side thing. So here it is, say, m0 over p0. Here is y0 l of i. Here's, a, here's an LM curve for M0 over P0. And we're here at I0 and Y0. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at in this direction this time. We'll do it a little bit different, but it comes out the same. You can do either one. I could have asked, hold Y constant, what's I have to do? If this goes up with Y constant, I has to <coughs> fall. That's what you can also do in that direction. A y constant. You could also find the IPM all is equal. So that's what we're going to do. Let this go up to M1 over P1. Now that's bigger, like over there. Income hasn't changed, but now we have an I1. So at the same level of income, interest rates lower. That's an equilibrium, so it has to be on the LM curve. So it must be that the LM curve shifting out or down, however you want to say. <coughs> so when M over P goes up, the LM curve shifts out. So we want to be monitoring policy. We'll say, okay, suppose M goes up, that shifts the LM curve out. So we'll, later, don't bother to write this, but later we'll say, okay, what does monetary policy do? Well, if we increase the money supply, we get a higher level of income and a lower interest rate. So we'll be able to look at policy. Then we can ask, when is monetary policy more or less effective, depending on the slope of the audience. And we can also drive an aggregate demand curve from that. I'll see. So if M over P goes up, LM shifts up. Last video has been retweeted in about 10 minutes. <laughs> that was next to the last
videos that I put up have had 780,000 views. Really. The one that's a really, probably 600,000 of those are 421. I put ads on and I give the money to the department. That'll make that much. It's like 100 or something. Tuesday's video is 53% complete. No, some of you said you had to leave. Before you forget, um, because I'm going to be gone the rest of the week and because you have a homework due next week, I'm going to have office hours on Monday. I'll be there at 1.30, normally at 2.30. I'm just going to stay there until 5 o'clock. So I'll be there pretty much all afternoon on Monday to sort of make up for being gone. And you're welcome to come by. And, and, you know, <coughs> I won't want to just answer your questions for you, so I hope you have questions for me. Uh, don't just come in having done nothing, trying to get me to do your homework. I'm not going to do that. But I'm more than happy to give you all the help you need. Um, can you talk about the midterm a little bit? Like, what? Because that's next Thursday, right? Yeah, I'll do that on Tuesday. I'm not going to do that. It'll be an essay, not multiple choice. I hate multiple choice. Um, and I never ever go into, okay, let me, I need this cue, sorry, because I do this sometimes. Well. So let's start. Um, so the midterm, yeah. So 
I am not the type that goes into the book and pulls things out of footnotes or other sorts of things because I just make them mad and I don't need to do that. The things I thought were important were the things I talked about in class. And so it's going to be, quite frankly, since I'm a leader here and that probably won't get processed in time, quite frankly, it'll be over the material in front of the class. I could say, show the IS curve a steeper wind, show the IS curve shifts out if um, what happens to the IS curve if government spending goes up, you know, all the kinds of derivations. Anything I did on the board except the math part, as far as I'm concerned, is fair game okay. for the exam. If you know your notes inside out, everything that's in them, you're going to be fine if you, you know, understand it. If you don't, you're not going to be fine. Right? So it's I really going to come down to exactly that. So I never try, I've been doing this long enough. You don't have to fool people. You don't have, I'll get this, if I try to fool you, I'll get the same distribution with the lower mean. So I may as well make you happy and ask straightforward questions. <laughs> but, you know, it doesn't mean that it'll be, it could be like homework problems with, with numbers that are easy so you don't need calculators. There's a hint. Um, so else have so it's more conceptual than probably yeah, probably so. Okay. I'm mostly uh, the the math stuff is just to help you build your intuition. But I'm really interested that you understand the models and how to manipulate it. So what I'm after is that you can ask models questions. Mm -hmm. What if people are, are less responsive to interest rates in recessions? How does that affect fiscal policy? The other thing I'll say is what we've just done is probably it is the hardest thing we'll have on this midterm. It's one of the hard things we're doing all year. We'll do one other thing where we use the ISLM curve with different slopes. And then we have to do things like figure out, you know, this is the one where the MPC is up. And we'll want to know, well, when is, you know, when is it more or less effective? And then you'll have to shift these things out. And you'll have to know how to shift them and things. That'll be a little bit hard, but it won't be quite like what we did. So this is kind of the hardest part, I think, of what we did. Because we're building up the things we need to answer the questions I want to do. So we've got to build the technical apparatus before we can do the fun stuff. So, but yeah, I'm more interested in, in, in those kinds of questions. I wrote a question on the IS curve. So that number, that's 6, it's in 6i. Is that six the responsiveness to yes. the interest rate? If the response is investment to the interest rate. Okay. So yeah. So that, that number goes up with a greater shift. That right, exactly. I can't remember what I did. Something like that. Yeah. I don't know what I did. Yeah. So that's <laughs> because the interest rate goes down, this is a negative change. Negative and negative is a positive, it shifts up. Got it. And it shifts up more when this when the absolute magnitude goes up. Okay. Yeah, so that minus six is the I of I. And this thing is what we would call an I of Y. It's D I D I. Got it. D big I D little I. This one is D I D I. All else equal, so it's a partial. So now we have to do the slope of the LM curve. <coughs> that part seemed easier than it did for the IS curve. So you might do I think I'm going to do the result first and then try to explain it. <laughs> Let me show you what I want to do this time is see what happens to the LM curve if I have a steep Y0, I0 versus a flat
And I just want to say, okay, suppose it's flat or steeper, what happens to the Allen curve? And then I'll say, why might this be flatter? I don't want to confuse the, I think I, I asked her, we got all worked up and why these have the slopes they have, and let's worry about that later. And just find the result. And then we'll ask, well, when would this be flatter or steeper? So this is the money demand curve. So we're going to start off with this one part, I0 and Y0. And we're going to increase the interest rate to I1. Excuse me, that's not what we're going to do. We're going to increase income to Y1. Both of these curves will shift out by the same amount. Remember when Y goes up, the money demand curve shifts out. This intersection point will just shift out. So with a flat curve, there's Y1L, and the curve is flat. We'll go to this interest right here. And there's I1 with a flat curve. So in that case, we get that LF curve. The steeper curve, the interest rate goes all the way up to there. See that? So there's the intersection with the, with the steeper curve. So as this thing gets steeper, the interest rate moves up. So just shift this flat one out and then start making it steeper, pivot it around that point and the interest rate gets bigger and bigger. So in that case, we get to this I1 here, same shift in Y, but a bigger shift in um, interest rate. So now we're going to get a much steeper LM curve. So what we've shown is that a steeper money demand curve gives us a steeper so that's just a technical. I didn't ask, I didn't just set when will this be flat or steep. But just suppose we had a flatter or steeper money demand curve, that would give us a flatter or a steeper LM curve. That's all there is to it. So now let's ask when is the money demand curve? Flatters. See. Last time I started here, and you got all lost in this part about model. Technically, it's not hard. You just start with two different slopes and drive the under twice. So, uh, here's the money demand curve, right? I'm using real money to do that. So this is y. So there's the rise and there's the run. Here's the interest rate. Here's money demand. So the slope. Is what? It's the responsiveness <coughs> of what? Of, this is the change in money demand, right? And this is the change in interest rate. <coughs> if this went up more for the same fall in the interest rate, we got a flatter curve. So the more that money demand responds to the interest rate, the flatter the curve. So it's the responsiveness of money demand to the interest rate. That turns out to be L of I.
see that? Because real money demand is Y L of I. The slope is just, it's very simple. You lower the interest rate and money demand goes up. It goes up by the amount this function goes up. And that's L of I. So when I goes down, this goes up by the response in this by L of I. So the bigger L of I is an absolute value, it's a negative number. But the bigger L of I is an absolute value, the flatter the LM curve. So the slope of the LM curve depends upon the responsiveness of money demand. So, so this is the same as saying steeper M, that's the same as saying a smaller responsiveness of money demand. Why do we even care about this? Why am I torturing you? In the real world, we think the LM curve is something like this. And the reason why its slope changes over the business cycle, I meant for this to be completely flat at some point. This flat part is called a liquidity trap. If you've heard that term in the news or anywhere lately. And that liquidity trap happens with L of I is infinite. We believe, for reasons I'll talk about later, that as income falls, this L of I parameter changes in a way that makes this really flat. Now notice that if we do fiscal policy up here, if I increase government spending so the IS curve shifts out, I don't get much of an impact on output at all. So near full employment, fiscal policy might not be very effective. But in a liquidity trap, the same exact change in the IS curve gives you a much larger change in output. So, so we think this, this is a way of showing that as L of I gets smaller and smaller, fiscal policy is less and less effective. It's because you have complete cracking out. So that's really, that's why I'm doing this. <coughs> Say, okay, when is it steep, when is it flat? Because it has a huge impact on the effectiveness of fiscal policy. And if you're stuck in a liquidity trap, this model tells us that fiscal policy would work. What monetary policy is in a situation, then we said M shifts this curve out. What it does is it shifts it like that. So if you do monetary policy in a, in a, in a liquidity trap, what happens? Nothing. But over here, near closer to full employment, you're getting changes in output when you shift this thing out. So it restores it. So it has more effect in less than full employment than it does in the recession. And you can also have to worry about the slope of the IS curve, because depending on how the slope, IS curve is slope would be different impacts too. And so the policy of effectiveness of monetary and fiscal policy is going to depend critically on the slope of these curves. When you're stuck in a liquidity trap. It may be that fiscal policy is your own way out. Maybe not. Look at those questions. But anyway, it's not just, gee, here's the way I can push the model just to make the class hard. I want to try to get at some questions that are really important in terms of understanding monetary and fiscal policy. And we can't do that unless we know about the slopes of the IS. So what do you need to know? Three things. Derive these curves graphically. Understand when they're flatter or steeper graphically and intuitively. And understand when they shift. <coughs> OK. 
let's just check our intuition. Check our graphs. So M over P is Y L L right? Let me find the slope of the LM curve mathematically and see if it's true that if L of I goes down, it gets steeper. Because that's what I claim. Let's check that. So here's the total derivative. Slope, I need to hold m and p constant. I just want to know how are y and i related to all that's equal. So this is zero, this is zero. So if zero equals dy l of i plus y l of i dy. So di dy, the slope of the LM curve, is minus l of i over y. So as this thing goes to zero, what happens to the slope? Steeper and steeper and steeper. That's what we claimed. L of i goes to infinity, the slope goes with the slope. So the, the flat part is when L of I is near the pin. That's what we're doing. That happens when money and bonds are perfect, perfect substitutes. But again, that's something I'll take up later. Okay, the house is built. Now it's played. Now what we do is put the IS curve, which shifts with G, T, and autonomous expenditures. Those are the shifters that we looked at. So we showed last time if any of these things change, the IS curve shifts. We know about its slope. We know how to derive this. We got an LM curve. And it depends upon m over p. Where those things intersect, we have an equilibrium. So that's the one pair, i of y, i and y, that's an equilibrium in both the goods and the money market. So there's only one unique equilibrium. Well, it's linear. <laughs> there's one unique equilibrium. There's one unique pair, I and Y, that can solve both markets simultaneously. And that's this one. Now, I haven't really talked about the forces that drive us to this point. It's kind of technical to do that. I don't know if I will or not. But you can also show that there are forces out there that will drive you to that point. You're not on it. You just, it's in my notes. I'm supposed to talk about it. I think I'll move that page to another place. <laughs> um, so let's talk about policy. So let's look at fiscal policy. In the short run, because we're still holding price constant in this model. We're not letting the price vary yet. Our results will be different when we let prices change. So what we're going to do is valid for a time period when prices are held fixed. So fiscal policy is a plan for government spending and taxes to achieve some goal, whatever that goal might be. And so let's look at either a T up or a T down. 
that way I'm sort of not you know, Democrat or Republican. I want to take a position in politics. So either one will stimulate the economy in this model. Take your favorite government spending going up or taxes going down. What does that do to the IS curve? What did we show happens in the IS curve? We see how we said anything that increases spending, it's not I, shifts it out. So you get IS or G up or T down. Everything else, con that's self-constant. So the model tells us that output would go up and the interest rate would also go up. So this model says when one of those things happen, you get an increase in income and a decrease, increase in the interest rate. I'm going to break it down this way. Let's first move out to here. That's not the new equilibrium point. But government spending goes up, shifts out the IS curve by that amount. The increase in income causes Y L of I to go up, causes money demand to go up. So that money demand is greater than money supply, and what we're keeping. What does that do? What's the price of money? Interest rate. So it drives interest rate up. But that causes investment to go down. And income to go down. So this is the first change here. This part from here on is all the movement back to this point. So you see here from this income level here the interest rate goes up and output. This fall in output here is an offset to this one. It's never, this is never going to be bigger than this one. There should be an up here. So I'm just decomposing in a way that's intuitively easy for the questions you want to ask. You can think of this first shifting out the interest rate constant. That throws the money market out of equilibrium. So interest rates rise and incomes fall bring the money market back into equilibrium. So we're all done, we end up at this point. So this is an offset. This is called crowding out. What's going on here is you have y equals c plus i plus g. If it's government spending, g goes up. Let me do it that way. If it's, the other, if it's taxes, c goes up. Let's do this one. Government spending goes up. So that causes output to go up by the multiplier. So right here, there's actually the, the, the simple multiplier tells you how much that goes up. It's a horizontal shift in the IS curve. But then the increase in income causes the, the um, money demand and interest rates to go up and investment to go down. So this falls. 
So the net impact is the primary shift plus the crowding out. Government spending crowds out private investment to some degree. And when this LM curve is really steep, what would happen if the LM curve looked like that? What would the change in output be? Be zero. It'd be complete crowding out. That's what we're going to get in the long run, by the way. Uh, and when it's really flat, you get very little crowding out. So depending on the value of L of I, we just talked about, you'll get different. I'll, I'll do the policy effectiveness later. I'm just interested in this right now. This other stuff is just setting up what we're going to do next week. But you can see, that depending on the value of L I, slope of the LM curve, you're going to get different amounts of crowding out. <coughs> In the liquidity track, it's completely flat. So you get no crowding out of private investment. Near full employment, you can get complete crowding out. If this thing is really steep. So that all the government spending does is reduce investment in the private sector dollar for dollar. In the liquidity trap, you don't tend to see this at all. The reason is that in a liquidity trap, remember that I of I parameter? <coughs> but anyway, we'll, we'll come back. spending crowds out private investment, makes private investment shrink. When government spending goes up, we have an increased taxes. So there's more borrowing. There's more demand for money and from all. And that drives interest rates up. That makes private investment more expensive. So private investment tends to fall. So the government is crowding out private investment by competing for the same funds that everyone's borrowing. So the government spending, when they deficit spend more, they have to borrow more. That drives interest rates up, it drives investment down. In a severe recession like we're in now, where there's lots and lots of excess reserves that are not lend, there's extra money financial markets. So when the government borrows more, it doesn't have much of an impact on interest rates because of all those excess funds floating around. So you don't tend to see crowding out. So in a, um, in a recession, this effect tends to be fairly small. Near full employment is nearly one to one. And so where you are in the business cycle makes a big difference about how much crowding out. The, the main reason for it is going to be this. I'll, I'll do that one. <laughs> I'm sorry. The math for this one's kind of hard. I don't know if I should do that. So that's fiscal policy. What about monetary? Never 
looked at Kruger's block. This is the model he's been saying it's really done well during the crisis. This model of ISLM. Okay, simple. We just did this. Increase M. What happens to the Allen curve? It shifts down or to the right. intuition for monetary policy. The result's easy. M goes up, Y goes up, interest rates tend to fall. They actually do the policy the other way around. They say, let's lower the interest rate, and that requires them to increase the money supply. The model works essentially the same. So, yeah. So when M goes up, M over P goes up because P is fixed. So money supply is greater than money demand. So what happens to the interest rate? Yes, and so you take the money and you buy bonds. That drives the price of bonds up and the interest rates down. So investment goes up, income goes up. Then there's an offsetting effect. Um, I'm going to leave that out for a moment. That's basically what goes on right there. I mean, there's words that go with this. This is just shorthand. I mean, that's not the intuition. The money supply goes up, that means real money goes up, so real money supply is better than real money demand. People take the extra money, they buy bonds, the price of bonds goes up, the interest rate goes down. Because loans are cheaper, people invest more. When they invest more, that's an increase in demand. So inventories start to fall, when inventories fall, that drives output up. And then I could I could feed this back into the money demand. That causes money demand. Anyway, that's enough. That's the basic intuition. Let me, we just said if the IS curve were vertical, instead of this way, what would the change be? Zero? Just, just for fun, don't worry about this for now. I'll come back to this. But where would that fit in here? If that's because of I of I, that's this right here, right? That's I of I. Suppose I of I were zero, what would that happen to output? It wouldn't change at all. Because when the interest rate falls, there's no change in investments so and no change in income. So when I of I is zero, monetary policy is ineffective because you can't get investment to go. Monetary policy works by lowering interest rate to stimulate investment. If you're in a recession, it's a cane, so there's many a slip, it's cup and lip. So um, when you're in a recession, you lower the interest rate. You don't get any response of investment, so it's ineffective. So that's one of the reasons monetary policy tends to be ineffective in a recession, is this link is really hard to make happen. You can change, and then you hit the zero bound, and you can't move this hardly at all. Even before you hit the zero bound, it's not all that effective, and once you hit the zero bound, you can't move this hardly at all, so you can't get output to go up. Fiscal policy might be effective in the case of that. So the interest rates are so low that people aren't investing at that low rate anyway. So it's because the economy is in such dour shape that even at very low interest rates, they're, yeah. they're, slow, right? they're still unwilling. Yeah. Yeah. But does it, but monetary policy is like it's positive on both ends, interest rate going down. And the interest rate does go down, even in this case. No, but I mean it, when they're when the IS curve isn't completely vertical. Which yeah, yeah, yes. Isn't it the best case scenario for interest rates to go down and output to go up? Yeah, yeah. So wouldn't would monetary policy be 
We had some fat people. And that's why all during what we call the Great Moderation, when we had um, from 84 to 2007, the economics literature hardly talked about fiscal policy at all. It's in the hands of Congress. It's really hard to do. You can't depend on it. It's not systematic. There's a lot of ideological things attached to it, blah, 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 blah. And so even though fiscal policy probably works in normal times also, it's much more politically charged and much harder to use. We've got this independent body called the Federal Reserve that doesn't have all these political constraints. So during normal times, we tend to rely upon monetary policy and to shift fiscal policy in the background and don't worry about it. Plus, in good times, fiscal policy tends to just crowd things out anyway. And so it's not very effective. When you get into a recession, though, things start to change. Yeah. Monetary policy loses an effectiveness both because you get it's it's not literally zero, but it's close to zero. You don't get much impact, and there comes a point when you hit the zero bound when it's really hard to manipulate this. You can still do QE and try to bring down long-term rates. They were talking like you know 0 0.1, 0 0.2 changes in long-term interest rates in QE. Very very tiny things get much impact on investment. So, so monetary policy becomes much more difficult for, for those reasons during it. And you can see all the debates right here in these intuitions and these diagrams about exactly all the things that have been debated out there during, during the process. And that's exactly what So those are, that's what I'm trying to get at is when is monetary policy more or less effective. Right now I don't really want to ask those questions. I'm just trying to do a simple, what's the intuition for this? And this is just setting things up for the lower end of the way. So all that torturing in the last two days hopefully has some payoff in terms of understanding the things. You can ask um, all sorts of things. Suppose the Fed has a constant interest rate rule. What's that do to the effectiveness of fiscal policy? Suppose you do fiscal policy. So you have IS G0, T0, LM, M0 over P, and you have interest rate. And we cut taxes. Last time I've been doing government spending, let me cut taxes and stuff. Let me, let me, let me be ready. Nothing actually happened. Um, and so we cut taxes. I asked G0, T1. So before the Fed responds, output would go up that much, interest rate would go up. But if the Fed's following a constant interest rate rule, what should they do? They need to increase the money slot. They need to hit the, that point, right? So now the Fed would increase the money supply. So first, this would happen. The Fed would say, oh no, interest rates are higher. We've missed our target. So what do they need to do to hit their target? They need to increase the money supply. That's going to cause output to go up even more. And so that kind of policy would actually reinforce. The, the lesson I'm trying to get out here is actually a somewhat simple one. It's that we can't really understand fiscal or mo monetary policy unless we know how the other, one responds to the other, particularly fiscal policy. So if you want to know how fiscal policy works, you have to know how the Fed responds to the policy. The Fed could have also said, oh, wait, we think this is full employment. This is going to cause inflation, so what should the Fed do in that case? they could bring the LM curve back to try to prevent the inflation. They could say, oh, we're opening up an inflationary gap here. We're only in prices constant, so this is hard to see. But if you were worried that an increase in output would, would overstimulate the economy, and you think fiscal policy is doing too much, 
This is Richard Fisher of Dallas, likes to make this argument. Then what the Fed should do is offset fiscal policy by lowering the money supply in response to fiscal policy. That's what Greenspan threatened to do during when he was Fed president. He said, you know, you guys are going to try to stimulate the economy with fiscal policy. If you do, the Fed will think that your economy is overstimulated, and we're going to raise interest rates to offset it. So go ahead, if you want to, and cut tax and give your government spending rates. That's your choice. But be aware that the Fed's going to offset it by simply raising interest rates. And so you really can't think of monetary and fiscal policy in isolation. You have to think of them as, as, as a whole. Well, um, I got places to go. We're tired of being here. We only have two minutes left. I don't get to start something in. Thank you for being with you in the current state.